our next speaker is uh, Lynn Norseman, also from uh, Utrecht University. We are quite happy that so many of you crossed the channel to be here with us uh, today. It's very it's because all it was in Utrecht. <laughs> <laughs> you needed to pay back uh, the visit. Oh, all very welcome. Yes. And um, uh, Mr. Norseman will speak today about uh, Kel and his position on our experiences during the first world war. Not exactly, but I will explain. Okay. <laughs> I'll take some more. Dear colleagues and uh, friends, when I was asked to contribute to this symposium and I looked at the subjects, there was one uh, obvious, there was an obvious one missing, the First World War. So, lightheartedly, uh, I informed the organizers that this would be my topic. <laughs> but soon I realized that my idea to compare Geil uh, to his contemporaries, like for instance, Kolodron, Brugmans, and Kerkholm. Uh, his Utrecht predecessor, and also <coughs> his formidable historian and journalist, was already covered by my Rotterdam colleague Pete Blas. But when reading in Heil's memoirs uh, concerning these years, I found an intriguing passage. On page 59, we find that he intended to write a biography on the politician uh, and secretary uh, of state for the colonies, Joseph Chamberlain, and that this led him to an interest in British imperial problems. He also writes that he became so <coughs> familiar with this topic that it guided his ideas into the 1940s, as he uh, says himself. So here is my uh, starting point for today, Peter Geil and the unity of the British Empire, or as he called it, the Rijksgedachte. In my opinion, this is not just one of the subjects that interested him during the time he served as a correspondent of the Dutch national newspaper Nieuwe Rotterdamse Courant, NRC, during the First World War. But it served indeed as a frame of thought, a frame for much of his ideas in the years to come. Within this subject, especially the idea of federalism has my attention. That is what I, I will talk about today. So, in a sense, this contribution of mine is still about Heil and the First World War, but, on the other hand, more specific about the impact of one of its aspects on his political thinking in later years. Of course, one can doubt what Heil writes in his memoirs, his autobiography, and moreover, it is only a small remark in a manuscript of a few hundred pages. But still, I think, there is a point to be made in this respect. The first time, as I can see, as far as I can see, that Geil extensively wrote about this problem was in the NRC of August 31st, 1915, in an article titled Problemen van het Britse Rijk, Problems of the British Empire. The immediate cause for the contrib this contribution was the fact that the Canadian Prime Minister attended a meeting of the British cabinet. As Geil observed, the relationship between Britain and his, its dominions was notoriously, I quote, delicate and bad. But because of the war, according to Geil, this was a very important issue. He compared the situation with the Roman Empire, which had to reconsider its relations with its subjects and its allies after the transition from Republic to Empire. Geil was convinced that the situation after the, second, the First World War would have, been, would have the same impact as this transition a few millennia earlier. In the NRC article, he sketched the background of the problem in the second half of the 19th century when conservatives and liberals debated the question to what extent the colonies were to be free and independent. Partly as a result um, of the decision by the colonies themselves not to sever the bonds with the motherland, 
the imperialism of politicians like Joseph Chamberlain was made possible. But in the course of time, the different parts of the British Empire had developed a more and more self-conscious attitude, especially the issue of the war effort uh, of the Dominions against the Germans was, according to Heil, an important question and a potential leverage in the discussions about the empire directly after the war. In another article in the NSA of June 15, 1917, Heil pointed at Jan Smuts, the South African military leader, member of the Imperial War Cabinet, and soon to be Prime Minister of South Africa, who would reject all federalist solutions for the empire and who really was in favor of another solution, namely the solution of a League of Nations-like solution, the association, free association of peoples. This is the first time, to my opinion, that Geil writes about federalism and federalist solutions. He became interested in the idea partly because he was fascinated by the person of Joseph Chamberlain and later in his life he would have chosen the term a figure, a character for someone like Chamberlain. <coughs> his plan was to write extensively on him and he thought the Dutch monthly, De Gids, might have been interested in a few articles on him. In the end, he did not want them and instead Geil published three lengthy, very descriptive contributions in the 1970 volume. They were titled the constitutional, the constitutional development of the British Empire. And he started them with a detailed history of 19th century British imperialism and the attempt to establish a way of federative co cooperation in the Imperial Federation League of 1884, which supported a federalist kind of organization for the British Empire. As I said, these contributions to the Gids are very descriptive and it is hard to identify Geil's own opinion, but he wrote about this subject. The subject did not let go of him. In his memoirs, Geil writes that he, according to him, uh, that he, according to him, Pecunia Causa, treated the subject again in the 1920s in the periodical Economisch Statistische Berichten and in the daily De Locomotive in the Dutch East Indies. Contributions to the locomotive could not be identified, not even by Pete, uh, but he indeed published a series of articles in the Economisch Statistische Berichten about the imperial conferences. And in his first article for the Economisch Statistische Berichten, the ESB, Geil concludes that it is very likely that at a certain moment the dominions will be completely self-governing and unities, but he also supposes that in the end all involved parties would not want to be the empire to fall apart. The question to him is, which shape the empire will have in the future? And one of the possibilities to him is the federalist solution of which most of the minions were not so keen. Federalism, according to Geil, has only a chance when connected territories are involved, geographically connected territories. But even then, the history of the position of Holland in the Dutch Republic shows how difficult it is to achieve equality among the different parts of the Federation. The Federalist problem is again the subject in an article in the ESB in 1930. But now it is about British East Indian internal federalism. In the preceding years, India was also growing in the direction of self-rule and self-destination. Geil did not have much confidence in this process because he considered India as partly a very backwards and underdeveloped country. Moreover, the Federation can, according to him, only exist when the diverse forms of government are more or less the same, which wasn't the case in India. Another problem was the Hindu-Muslim antithesis, which was in the way of the real federalist solution for India. 1931, Geil writes, almost always federations come into existence when already independent unions decide to come together. Interestingly, in these publications, Geil never makes an allusion to the Dutch East Indies, and I think there is a reason for that. 
I never found a thorough comparison made by him between India and the Dutch East Indies, but we all know about his attitude to colored people. He wasn't specifically interested in the racial segregation of early apartheid when he visited South Africa in the 1930s. And in one of his letters to Gerritsson, he mentions that the peoples from the East are not so, let me call it, dynamic. I think this is the reason that you can imagine how difficult that might be, the Federalist solution for the British Empire, but not for India and thus not for Indonesia. So federalism might be a solution to complicated political situations, but only, as we have seen earlier, when it is about federalism between peoples. And we have seen also that, according to Geil, federalism only tends to be successful when it is about federalism of geographically connected entities. It is interesting that in his publications about the constitutional problems of the British Empire, he never mentions the Flemish question. After all, in 1929, he was one of those who were involved in the proposal of a federal statut for the Belgian communities. Here, his earlier thoughts about federalism fit in with his Groot Nederlandse Gedachte, the Greater Netherlands idea. Most of you know the debate, and Piet van Hees spoke about it this morning, whether Geil really <coughs> believed in the Belgian Federation, or that his ultimate goal was the breaking up of the Belgian state. In the three-volume correspondence, Geil and Vlaanderen, edited by Arie Willemsen and Piet van Hees, one can find ammunition for both positions. Yes, on more than one occasion, he says that the proposition of a federal charter is pure tactics. One might say that he suggests a Fabian tactics of slow progress with the aim not to estrange the not so radical pro Flemish allies. On more than one occasion, Geil writes to his correspondents that Belgium isn't worth a straw. For much of those involved, the debate about the real intentions of Geil's political Greater Netherlands idea, among them Louis Vos and Lode Wils, this is enough to conclude that he is not completely sincere in his collaboration with the Federalists. On the other hand, in the correspondence, you can find enough passages in which he really seems to believe in a Federalist solution for the Belgian problem. Maybe it's not an ideal solution, but if everyone works on it wholeheartedly, the Federal Car Charter must be given a chance to prove its viability, according to him. Maybe there is tactics involved, but not so much the tactics of slow Fabian-like progress in which the Federal solution is only a stage on the way to a greater Netherlands. The tactics that might be what he, might be what he knows very well, that the Belgian Francophonie will not accept in this federation of communities based on language. It must be said, however, that the proposed federation is completely in line with what Geil saw as the preconditions for a federal solution for the British Empire. Equal communities, with equal interests, and partly based on self-defense against the hostile world. And what also may be important is a quote that he knows very well as a historian, he must be very much aware of this, that he knows very well what the tearing up of Belgium might mean to the European equilibrium. As an inhabitant of London and as a journalist, he was at the center of the European disaster of the First World War, and he must have seen the importance of balancing the fragile European political situation. Speaking of Europe, the Federalist concept becomes an issue again in the work of Peter Geil after the Second World War. This time it emerges in the context of the very beginning of the European Union. This is also the period when Geil was not only the well-known historian with his contradictory ideas about the history of the Dutch Republic and the House of Orange, Orange Nassau, but also he was the public intellectual on which Remco Emsel will elaborate in a minute. One of the interesting features of the post-war Geil is his inclination to the philosophy of history, especially, of course, to be found in his discussions with Toynbee, which brought him world fame, and in his preface to his Napoleon book with the famous quote that history is a discussion without end. 
which is, uh, to my opinion, nothing more than platitude. <laughs> In 1953, he published a speech of his uh, titled An Historical Statement over the World for Nu, An Historian Towards Today's World. The subtitle of this contribution was The European Federation. And he tried to tie the two subjects together. I must say that this essay of more than 60 years ago has nothing lost of its urgency and has a meaning for us here today, and especially here, I must say, sadly, in this country. Gell sets out with the question, what history is good for? Does it help to understand the complex world of today, he asks. He begins his search for an answer with Friedrich Nietzsche's von Nutzen und Nachteil der Historie für das Leben, and its rejection of an excess of history, which leads, on the one hand, to paralysis and renouncing action, and on the other hand, to a very strong urge to action, which turns on to fanaticism, because people think they are acting in opdracht van de tijd, by order of the times, as Geil called it, quoting the title of a book by his communist Amsterdam colleague Jan Romain. Geil speaks of a false fatality, there is, according to him, no predestined course of history. History is an open process. In this respect, our time, he says, is a direct result of a series of catastrophes in conjunction with, and I quote, far-reaching and deep-rooted causes, end quote. To make clear what he means, he uses the plans for a European Federation as an example. It was commissioned by the six ministers of foreign affairs from the countries that together constituted the European Council and the European Coal and Steel Community. The plan included a European Parliament with two chambers, European elections, partly direct, and there were also ideas about the European Court of Justice. Geil called this rather unitarian, a centralized plan. But no worries, he writes. It's just a plan, no more. The danger he sees is that some groups in Europe will see these developments as inevitable. It is, according to him, the course of history. To them, the course of history. And then those groups think large parts of the inhabitants of Europe do not really want it is because they are not yet ready for it. And this is only a matter of time. And just think of what happened in the last few years, and you will, see, you will see how prophetic he was. But that is not the point I would like to make. Geil is not against a federal solution for Europe's problems. He thinks it, on the contrary, a basic need for European stability. But he was, doesn't want to go fast, and he wants to be sure that those who go on with the process first have to try to come nearer to each other. The Italian parliamentarian tradition is another one than the Dutch tradition. And the Germans have different interests than the French. And he adds, Europe isn't Europe without the United Kingdom and the Scandinavian countries. And we find the same idea in a contribution for the daily newspaper Het Parole in 1954, titled Om Orthodoxe Bedenkingen tegen de Klein Europa Politiek unorthodox considerations against the politics of a small Europe. And it is as relevant as can be for today's politics. He observes that there is very much vagueness in the ideas about Europe. He also observes that there is very much vagueness. <coughs> he also observes that there is no real public discussion about the subject, and that politicians suggest that Europe embarked upon a road that passed the point of no return. Kyle wonders if that is really the case. He has a few points to make. First, when politicians talk about Europe, they are talking about a very limited concept of Europe, namely the Europe of the six. And this isn't Europe, according to Kyle. This can never be the idea of Europe. Secondly, he asks if a united Europe can serve as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. For that, according to Kyle, it would have been better to make Germany a member of NATO. This limited idea of Europe is not European idealism, but it is French realpolitik, as he says. 
And in the third place, Geil doubts very much the idea of European elections. There is no system, according to him, of European political parties. He rejects a European federalism that will lead to a European hodgepodge in which there, are, there is no place anymore for national traditions and peculiarities. What he really wants, he writes in an afterword to this newspaper contribution, is a European federation that does justice to national characteristics. He never has doubted, he writes explicitly, that such a federation is necess necessary that it should be an economical and a military federation. But he also has some misgivings about some of the federative ideas. What he really wants is a more inclusive Europe, not the Europe of the six. But even then, he doubts the transition of power to a European parliament. Small countries like the Netherlands would lose their uniqueness. And here again, we see Geil's idea of a federalism in optima form. Yes, federalism is a solution for political division, but this will only work with equal partners. That was the case in the example of the relation of the United Kingdom to its dominions. It would have worked in Belgium if Wallonia would have been prepared to see Flanders as an equal partner. And it would have led to a united Europe if he could have been convinced that small nations could maintain their uniqueness within the greater European idea. And so to conclude, I hope to have shown that the idea of federalism indeed was central to much of Peter Geil's political thought, an idea he encountered during the First World War, there is the First World War, when he observed what the war did to the relationship of the United Kingdom and its former colonies. Federalism was to him a solution for a divided world, but only when all partners in the Federation would agree to work on equal.